Imagination and creativity play important parts in our lives, in our society, in science and technology, in philosophy and ethics, and our speakers have um, done a lot of work to synthesize the um, uh, perspectives that come out of the creative arts, that come out of the humanities, that come out of the human and social sciences, and that come out of science and technology. To introduce our speaker tonight, I'd like to welcome up Margaret Owen, who is the director of the Center for Children and Families. She is let's bring on my cheat sheet, the Robinson Family Professor in the School of Brain and Behavioral Sciences, and she's the program head of human development and early childhood disorders. So please welcome up Dr. Margaret Owen. I'm very happy to see you and a nice crowd and lovely turnout. It's going to be a great evening tonight. Um, I do direct the Center for Children and Families and when asked to co-host tonight's speaker, Dr. Sandra Russ, I couldn't have been more pleased. It couldn't be more appropriate for the work that the Center for Children and Families does. Um, the Center for Children and Families is in its 10th year of holding a spring lecture series, and it's great that we could fill one of our slots with Dr. Russ. It, it, it pleases me no end. So thank you, Magda, <laughs> wherever you are, for the opportunity to do this and for asking us to join, to join you. Um, I really jumped at the chance of co-hosting Dr. Russ's visit. Um, she is widely recognized and much applauded for her expertise and wisdom on issues of pretend play, how to measure pretend play, and its important role in children's development. It fits very much, it couldn't be more applicable to the outreach work of the Center for Children and Families and the programs that we've been developing and now implementing in high need communities in the Dallas area. Our playful learning program, Play With Me or Wege Conmigo, is delivered to children and their parents in high need communities and it strives to foster their healthy development by focusing both on how they can learn through play and how to support their parents in helping their children to grow with a engaged parent relationship and to enjoy their play and to learn from it. Um, we focus on gentle guidance, guidance of the children and of their parents in guiding their children. And uh, we had a wonderful discussion uh, this afternoon with Dr. Russ of her theories, her findings, and, and what we're seeing in, in our families. And so it was great, very, very stimulating. So it's my great pleasure to introduce her to you. Dr. Russ is Distinguished University Professor and Louis B. Beaumont University Professor at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Since, since receiving her doctorate in clinical psychology from the University of Pittsburgh, her distinguished academic career has been spent at Case Western as professor, research scholar, director of clinical training, school dean, associate provost, and I'm sure a revered colleague by everyone at the university as well as in her field. She's author of well over 100 journal publications and has six books, including Affect and Creativity, The Role, the Role of Affect and Play in the Creative Process. Uh, let's see, da, da, da. I'm getting them mixed up. There let me tell you her latest book, which is outside. <laughs> it is Play in Childhood, Foundations for Adult Creativity. Dr. Russ's measure of pretend play was groundbreaking work early in her career. It provided a standardized way of looking at imagination and the expression of emotions experienced in play. Through her work, she's become one of the most recognized of scholars in children's pretend play. She and her research team have investigated relations between pretend play and many areas of adaptive functioning, including creativity, coping, and emotional understanding. And she's de developed play intervention procedures to help children in 
improve their skills at playing. I hope we hear more about that. I'm looking forward to her insights and wisdom she's going to be sharing with us this evening. What could be more important than the work that you do? So please come up and join me in welcoming Dr. Russ. Okay, yes. Thank you so much for this really lovely introduction and for a wonderful day. I've been really welcomed here uh, and enjoyed so much hearing about the Play With Me program. Um, so I have two themes uh, this evening in my talk. Uh, two basic messages. <laughs> One is that it is important to identify creative potential in children, and two, that it's uh, important to learn how to develop creative processes in children through the vehicle of pretend play. Pretend play, just a quick definition, uh, involves the use of fantasy, the use of make-believe, symbolism and transformation of objects, expression of emotion, and as Greta Fine said, in pretend play, one thing is playfully treated as if it were something else, and that playful quality is also very important. Affect is intertwined <coughs> with pretend play, and it's an interaction between cognitive processes and affective processes that Dorothy and Jerry Singer so uh, beautifully wrote about. And when we think about pretend play, we think about, you know, what is unique uh, uh, in childhood? What, did, what, what does pretend play bring to child development that is unique? It's a natural activity. In many ways, children are wired to engage in pretend play. It's a universal activity. You see pretend play in all cultures to different degrees of complexity, depending on the culture, but it's, it's worldwide. Am I echoing? So should I do something? Can you do something about the echo? Keep talking, okay. You can hear me? Um, it's, play is self-generating, right? So children are making something up from scratch. And that's really important when we start to think about creativity and what's involved in creativity, that the individual is making things up from scratch. It's self-reinforcing. It's fun for most children, not all children, but most children. Many creative processes are expressed and practiced across domains. It involves the whole child, speech, motor, emotion, intellect. <coughs> it's open-ended, and it be can be used in different ways depending upon the interests of the, of the child and needs of the child. So uh, just a few words about creativity. Uh, there's a large literature in creativity, and when we think about creativity, we think about two things, creative product and creative process. So the product, if it's uh, music, a piece of music, piece of art, uh, a scientific uh, discovery, uh, an engineering uh, development, bridge, a building, the product to be deemed creative has to have some new element, right? So to be creative, it has to have something new, something novel, but it also has to be good in that it uh, is judged by experts in the area to be a contribution. 
or to be of good quality. So you need those two characteristics, uh, goodness <laughs> in the domain and newness. And of course, there are different degrees of um, creativity. It can be a little bit <laughs> or a lot. And, and uh, it can also occur on everyday life and people these days are talking about everyday creativity. You may not be contributing to a field, but in your daily life, <laughs> you are creative in adapting and problem solving and dealing with whatever is coming your way. Uh, in that way, we start to think about resilience and you start to see the link between creativity and, re and resilience. So that's the creative product. And what I've been interested in studying is, okay, what is it within the individual? What are the creative processes within the individual that helps one be creative in whatever domain you're working in or in your daily life? What are the processes within the person that increases the odds that if you're in the right place at the right time, <laughs> you're going to really be able to come up with something unique and creative? Um, we think about creativity as being on a continuum, and that's why we can talk about creativity in children. I mean, children, I mean, some people say, well, how can you think about creativity in children? They're not contributing anything to a field. Well, no, but for their age group, you can look at how original their thinking is, and in their everyday life, you can look at how creative their problem solving is, um, and so we can think about uh, children being creative, even though it's not, you know, big C creativity. So many of these processes that are important in, in creativity, in helping people be creative, you can see in pretend play. And it's this overlap uh, that you see in the literature, that you see in research. If you watch children play, that is their creative act. It's one of their creative acts. So um, just a minute on theory. <laughs> um, why should pretend play relate to creativity? Why, what are these processes? You can really think of play as children practicing, kind of practice <laughs> with processes important in creativity. They practice with divergent thinking, that is generating many different ideas. Uh, not just one idea, but many different ideas. <coughs> practice with object transformations and, and symbolism. So blocks can be many different things. Legos can be many different things. Uh, so children practice with that object uh, transformation. They manipulate ideas and recombine ideas in their stories, right, by themselves, with other people. They organize story narratives. They practice with self-generating thought. And again, I come back to that point about um, coming up with ideas from scratch, not bouncing off another stimuli, but just making things up on their own. They are incorporating memory and what they've seen on TV and video games, but it's coming out of them, and then they're recombining. And all of these characteristics are uh, important processes in creative thinking. And also emotion, which until recently was fairly ignored in the creativity area, both in adults and in children. A lot of focus on cognitive processes. <laughs> But what about emotion? Uh, Greta Fine talked about emotion being important. The, psycho the psychoanalytic group talked about emotion and creativity. They used a very different language, but they really talked about the importance of um, uh, too much repression, <laughs> to use that old-fashioned term, can constrict one's thinking. So when we look, think about emotion and affect, Children express a lot of emotion in play. If you watch children play by themselves with other kids, a lot of uh, affective themes, monsters, 
uh, cops and robbers, spacemen, you know, a lot of emotion in what's going on in children's play. And you can really see them practicing with emotional expression, emotional processing, learning to deal with negative emotions, getting comfortable with emotion, um, and with emotional fantasies, with pretend, right? Also, thinking about emotion, experiencing joy. <laughs> you know, again, if you watch <coughs> typical children play, they should get lost in the play. They should uh, enjoy uh, and, and maybe start to experience the joy of creative expression. And when you talk to adult creative people or anybody who's in the middle of a creative act, it's joyful. You know, they talk about the flow experience. It's joyful. And you start to see this in, in, children's, in children's play. And then um, children can kind of switch back and forth between kind of a free-flowing expression and then a good story narrative that's going around the, around the story. Uh, my interest in emotion really came from my, I did a lot of uh, therapy with children using play. And one of the main ways therapists are working with children when they use play is to help children express emotion, deal with emotion, uh, put a narrative around the emotion. So it's emotional processing. That's another important purpose of, of play. It should be related to creativity, and they've found this in adults, because if you're more open to um, emotion and emotion in memories, emotion in general, emotional images, you have a broader search process to come up with novel ideas. I mean, that's, that's the theory. So, um, and just to be kind of concrete, <laughs> um, Here's a list of some of the processes important within the individual that help people be more creative and what it looks like in play. Okay, and I'm going to show a tape in a minute to try to make this more real. But um, divergent thinking, different story ideas, different elements, the blocks can be lots of different things, broad associations, um, perspective taking. Uh, so important in writing and playwriting, right? Um, role play, <laughs> when children take the role of different characters. They're, used, they're developing the, the ability to take the perspective of, of the other. Affect themes and symbols, you see it in monsters and yummy <coughs> food and dolls fighting. And, and the joy, the joy that you can, can see uh, in the task. So, so I was interested in uh, studying pretend play and creativity. Is there really a relationship? Can we demonstrate it? But, but especially the emotion. You know, other people did very good work that showed that imagination in play related to measures of creativity. What about emotion? I was especially interested in that. So, um, and we need, if you're going to study pretend play, and changes in pretend play, you really need a measure. You need a standardized measure of pretend play. So in the 80s and early 90s, um, we developed uh, what I called the affect and play scale. Five minutes, standardized task, two puppets, three blocks. And here are the instructions, very simple. We wanted an unstructured task, so we would leave room for lots of individual differences. Uh, in because you have to have lots of individual differences if, if you're going to get develop a good measure. Um, so we basically, for children 6 to 10, so this is an older group, um, uh, two puppets, blocks, play with them, have them do something together for five minutes, and we videotape it and code it. And basically, oh, these are the puppets and blocks, and we have um, different ethnic minority versions of puppets. <laughs> um, and for younger children, we have a younger version because they need more stuff and they need more, for four and five-year-olds, <laughs> they need more uh, structure. So we have 
animals and a car and, and uh, little cups. And we, we model a little bit to get them going. We, have, we engage them more to get them going. And, and the mean scores, we, we then code the videotapes and uh, one through five measure of the organization of the story, one through five uh, code of the imagination, how much pretend, how much uh, fantasy, uh, how, how many different themes are there. And then we count the number of affective units in the narrative. For the affect, we really count the frequency of uh, the affect in the story. Positive affect, negative affect, variety of affect. We have 11 different affective categories. And then we look at comfort, which is really the wrong term. If I were doing this now, I would call it something else. It's really the enjoyment and absorption of the child in the play. Uh, lately, to make this measure more sensitive, especially when we're uh, trying to see if we can improve children's play, uh, we, we are also counting uh, in the uh, imagination area as well the number of different themes, the number of different transformations of the blocks, trying to get a more sensitive measure there. So just, just to give you a sense of what this is, um, I'm going to play a DVD. <laughs> this is a seven-year-old girl. She's a child of a graduate student, so she's not a research subject. Uh, she's comfortable. And you don't see the instructions here. She kind of gets right into it, but in essence, blocks, puppets, play with them for five minutes, have them do something together. And you can kind of see what this looks like. Want to play with the beads yeah. that I'm using to make my necklace? Okay. Can you hear? Do you like it? Do you like it? We're scoring that for affect, two affect units. <coughs> like my necklace? Yeah, I do. Yeah, like my necklace? Yeah, I do. That dialogue. Let's go to the playground. There's a There's a tunnel. And tunnel. And there's a funny slide. So you can see what she's doing with the blocks. It goes sort of straight. That's great, she says. So we're scoring that. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Happy effort. Happy effort. Okay, now let's go home. Let's go home. Now what can we do? I don't know, how about we draw? <laughs> positive effort. So now 
clouds, Play-Doh? Uh, yeah, Play-Doh, and we both use the green Play-Doh. Okay, let's make a building together with a funny shaped top. I mean, a skyscraper. Nah, we can make a person. How should we do that? Okay. Actually, I think it's a great. telescope. <laughs> now it's my turn. Hmm. S you want to see the last minute? You have one minute left. We give them a warning. <laughs> so if they want to put an ending, they can. A butterfly. That's right. Changing the frame, it's she's imagining another there. situation. Okay. Now they're becoming screens. <laughs> okay, it's time to stop. So. <laughs> so, if we were scoring her play, certainly five on imagination, right? Because she is using those blocks to be many different things. It's a really good example of divergent thinking, just being able to generate a lot of different ideas, a lot of different themes. The story pretty much hangs together. I mean, there's a plot, there's a time sequence. So the organization is, is pretty good. A lot of affect, right? She has, I think, about 25 units of affect in that five minute uh, section. Mm, average, is about for, you know, if you're looking at a group of 100 kids, about 12. Some children are very constricted and they don't express much emotion. Their imagination might be quite good, but they don't express much emotion in the play. Other children may have a lot of emotion, <laughs> but it's in a very disorganized story. So you can get different profiles uh, in the play. Uh, and so she had a lot of positive emotion, a little bit of negative emotion, the, the, the fighting, which is, you know, which is, it's really pretend, right? So it's really positive in that she's not distressed. She's, it's pretend negative emotion. Um, and she's also very, in, she's enjoying the play. She's involved. It's a joyful experience for her. So this child is really very good, a good player. We get lots of individual differences uh, when we give this measure. We've, we have um, about 28 published studies now using this measure or the, or the younger version. Most coming out of my lab, but not all coming out of my lab. And I'm focusing in this talk on creativity. Uh, so in creativity, what we find is if we, if we give children who do this play test, then we give them a measure, uh, a typical measure of creativity for children. I mean, there's no perfect measure, but divergent thinking measure is, is one. Um, we get moderate correlations, 30s, 40s, sometimes 50s, strong correlations between play ability, imagination and play, affect and play, and uh, divergent thinking. In different studies, we also find that when they tell stories, their stories are rated as more creative. Um, teachers rate them as more, um, using more imagination in the classroom. 
Uh, and also, I'm just adding coping in there, because if children can think of, children who are good at thinking of different things, when you ask them what to do in a stressful situation, they can think of more things to do in that situation. So you start to see, again, the link between creative thinking and, and coping and resilience. Importantly, in most of the studies, the relations between play and creativity measures are independent of intelligence. That's important because it's saying that what you see in play um, is something that's predictive of creativity, but it's not just based on intellect. It's a resource for children in addition to intelligence. So we find uh, low correlations sometimes in the teens, sometimes in the 20s, but in most studies when you then partial it out, there's uh, a, a lot of um, uh, variance <laughs> accounted for. Uh, in terms of predicting uh, creativity. And other people have found this also, that play in typical kids in this age group, 6 to 10, relatively independent of, of IQ. Um, when we follow these children, and we've done two different studies now with two different samples of kids. If we follow them, in this first study, they were first and second graders. We went back four years later. Is this relationship between early play and divergent thinking, the creativity test, stable over this four-year period? And it's relatively stable. Imagination in early play is predictive of creativity 0.42. It's pretty good. Um, and after, t after 10 years, uh, 0.30, but it's, there's still uh, a correlation there. Uh, we did this study again with a group of girls, uh, and after four years, found a correlation of 0.44. So it, it's looking very similar. It's really a replication, but with a different, different group, even when we control for baseline <laughs> um, diversion thinking. Uh, we, we went back and followed those girls after seven years, and got a very small sample. And it's one of the uh, methodological challenges in doing longitudinal research. How do you get them back? After four years, it's pretty easy. <laughs> you know, they're all still there. They're all young enough. When they get to high school, uh, they have other things to do. And maybe their parents might give permission, but they've got other things to do. So we, we had a very small sample, 19 kids. Uh, but we still found a correlation uh, reasonable correlation, and we also found that early play predicted um, how creative they thought they were when we gave them a self-report. Uh, kids who played more imaginatively thought they were more creative on a, on a self-report when they were seven years, seven years later. Uh, so just in general, uh, other things that play has been predictive of, coping, emotion regulation. I mean, we've, we've positive mood, pro-social behavior. I think we we've, have a pretty robust measure in terms of construct validity. It does not relate to <laughs> intelligence, executive functioning, at least as we've measured it, agreeableness, conscientiousness. I mean, it's, it's not, at least not the measure we developed, is not tapping aspects of play that relate, relate to, these, to these characteristics. Temperament, attachment. Um, the whole attachment area is a really important area. And, and I think this measure is not getting at attachment. I think you could develop a measure that would get at attachment. If we really started looking at cooperative, loving uh, interactions between the puppets and maybe had different scenarios, but, but uh, I think it's, it's not getting at that construct right now. Um, OK, so, I, so we can measure play. It relates to creativity. It's predictive of creativity over time. This is such a good thing. Can we show that play helps children develop? Everybody who works with kids, not everybody, almost everybody, <laughs> thinks that it does help children develop because they're practicing. But how do you show it? 
It's difficult. It's challenging to show it. Uh, Lillard, uh, in a 2013 article, concludes there's no support for play facilitation, especially in creativity, but in other areas as well because of methodological problems. <laughs> Others of us uh, feel that there are rigorous studies uh, that do support play facilitation of divergent thinking. Um, it's hard to do. Uh, Lillard's criticisms of methodology were certainly right on. Um, but I think there are studies out there that are rigorous. And we've tried to develop a play intervention protocol for typical kids that helps them become more imaginative in play. And, and therefore, hopefully, more creative. So uh, what we do uh, is our basic protocol looks like this. We play with the child. Uh, we have them make up stories, like get, have a boy getting ready for school, have a girl going to the zoo, uh, make up a story about a girl living underwater. And then we play with the child. Gentle guidance, which was the word um, that Margaret used uh, earlier, is kind of what we're trying to do to help them, we model, to help them develop imagination, storytelling ability, expression of emotion. And we use modeling, reinforcement, praise. Um, the control group that we used in several studies, puzzles, coloring sheets, <laughs> warm interaction, but no fantasy play, right? Um, and in this first study, uh, we used 50 first and second grade children from an inner city school in Cleveland, 99% African American, 92% below poverty level. Um, we gave them that play measure that I just showed you, pre and post. And then we had five sessions with them, 20 minute sessions in the school, um, one-on-one -on -one interaction. And we would have them make up maybe three or four stories every time. We had a bunch of toys, unstructured toys, Legos, um, plastic animals, people, people, um, dolls. <laughs> but dolls that appealed to boys and girls. Um, and in this first study, we had imagination group, affect group, and a control group. And what we found was that the play intervention was effective in that um, for the play groups, their play on this other measure given by other people <laughs> uh, got better, uh, more imaginative, more emotional expression. And they also got better on divergent thinking test and a coping measure. So it seemed to transfer to this other, these other measures. Interestingly, it was the affect group. <laughs> Make up stories with emotion, a boy losing his dog, a girl going to the doctor and getting a shot and she was scared. Stories that involved emotion seemed to be the most effective. So now, when we work with kids, we mix up the stories. Uh, the story going to the zoo, but also stories using emotion and we, we interchange, interchange them. When we followed up two to eight months later, interestingly, the imagination group continued, uh, in increased in imagination and affect expression. Um, it, was, it was the most effective. So the affect kind of didn't hold over that period of time. So we kind of mix it up now. That's what we decided to do. Um, so what, what do we, I'm going to show you an example of this also, but uh, what do we conclude now? We've done several studies with elementary school kids. Again, first and second grade is kind of the ideal age, I think, to do this kind of play intervention with. Uh, three to five play sessions. We, we can certainly increase imagination, storytelling, emotional expression in the play in these children. Uh, three to five sessions. In preschool kids, it's a whole different situation. Uh, we found that we could increase play skills in a museum setting when the mothers were present. Uh, 
in a different study in a, nurse, in a uh, music school settlement, when mothers were not present in these four and five year olds, um, their play school skills did not improve. And what we learned from this, I, I, as we thought about all this, is that for these young children, the mothers, the caretakers have to be involved. There has to be the continuity in the home. Uh, and so the, the work that you're doing with mothers and kids with these young children it, 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 Margaret, see, is important because you've got parents uh, involved. With the older kids, the six to ten year olds, they, they, they're okay. you can do these intervention, uh, intervention protocols just with the child uh, without the support at home. They're, they're able to consolidate it uh, on their own. Um, and, you know, if you can increase play ability, does it transfer to anything in the real world? Um, we think that in the, yes, we can in low SES kids, um, and in a group play intervention, group play for children in a group, we found that it did also transfer to divergent thinking for kids who were lower than average players to start with. <coughs> Um, we're doing a study right now with, in a Head Start uh, uh, Center, um, poverty area in Cleveland, where we're starting with the children uh, with this kind of intervention. We've sent um, uh, toys and work, work uh, kind of tips for parents home. Uh, we've had workshops for parents, but not many have come. They're, they're happy to have our kids work, uh, our, us work with their children. But um, So when we finish this pilot study, we want to really try to develop a program for the parents in terms of playing with their children at home, again with the goal of increasing the children's imagination and creativity in their, in their play. Um, I have time, I think, to show you um, uh, an example of, of what we do uh, in terms of trying to uh, improve, help a child develop better play skills. This is, a, again, a, this is a nine-year-old child, uh, a son of um, a faculty member. He's a very good player. He doesn't need me to be doing anything with him, but I wanted to demonstrate kind of what we're trying to do um, in this, with these children. So, um, so uh, I'll play a few minutes of this. Uh, we have a we use different toys each time, and I've already gone through a couple of stories with him in this session. Uh, make up a story. I'm going to play with you. Make up a story about, and then I give him the story stem. Um, and in this play, he gives a nice example of evaluating his own creativity. So he's going back and forth between generating ideas and then putting it into a story. Mm -hmm. And put score blankets on. Mm -hmm. And so then, then away when the boy is really sad, yeah. he takes off the blanket. No, I can't hear it either. Oh. And so then he's really elated. So, let's see. Um, Oh, over here. I see. Oh, he's elated. Yes. Hooray. Okay. okay. Um, now, make up a story about a boy who lives underwater. Boy who lives he underwater. Lives in the city underwater. Boy who lives in the city underwater. So, make up a story. there's an underwater city. Mm -hmm. And in the city, mm -hmm. there's these vehicles. Mm -hmm. And he loves riding in them. Mm -hmm. And so one day, he went to the surface mm -hmm. and saw something mm -hmm. that looked like this. he never seen it before. Yeah. So he tried riding it. Mm -hmm. And he decided he would call it the surfboard. Uh huh. And he thought he was a genius for making that up yeah. until he realized that other people had made it up when he saw other people riding it mm -hmm. on the surfboards. Mm -hmm. So then he got back in his boat, mm -hmm. went underwater, to decide to make something else. Mm -hmm. 
and he made the water skier that just goes around the water. Ah, on a ski. So it's a what? What is it? It's a water, a water scooter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then he takes the scooter. Yeah. He goes back underwater. Yeah. To his underwater home and tells everyone about his ski. Mm -hmm. But no one believes him. Mm -hmm. So then mm -hmm. one day his friends saw him riding it. Mm -hmm. So they tried to ride it, and then they all went home and told everyone, and then everyone wanted to ride the scooter. Ah, uh, can I ride? Can I ride? Sure. It? I just try to get in there. He doesn't need me in there, but I'm trying. Okay, and then I just whip, ride it around underwater. Yeah. Oh. Underwater or neat. above the surface. Oh. Are there fishes? I want to find some fish. Are there any fishes? Here. Um, so what could be a fish? Right there. there. Right there. Right there. All these fishes. Oh, oh like a neat. Oh, that's pretty. It's really so pretty. Thank you. So how I put an ending on there, how does it end? So then, mm -hmm. eventually, mm -hmm. he became famous because he invented the water scooter. Mm -hmm. And now everyone rides him. Oh. <laughs> and he's famous. Yeah. And he's happy about that. Mm -hmm. It's a really good story. So, how about if you make up a story? Make up a story about anything you want. Anything you want. Um, so a boy lived in his house. Well, he lived in a boat. And so every day he would go okay. riding. And I don't he would know how well you can hear all that. But, so then, but um, he, he made, you know, if he were having difficulty pretending, um, I was asking him if he could find fishes. <laughs> and if he couldn't have found fishes, making up Legos to be fishes, I would have modeled that for him. But he also, when he first developed the surfboard, he decided that it wasn't good enough because other people had already made a surfboard. And so he did this water ski, water ski thing. So he was kind of evaluating the novelty of his, of his product and, and changing it. Um, but this, this just gives a sense of what, what we're trying to do and the question comes up, you know, with a child like this who's imaginative and plays easily, does it make sense to, you know, try to work with them in this way? Uh, or should we be really working, and, and I think in terms of where our resources should go, it should be with children who are really having difficulty pretending, difficulty using their imagination, and we can help them develop these skills. Um, but with this kind of framework in mind. Um, so, Well, yeah, I think I've forgotten how to do it. But, um, oops, no, sorry. There we go, thank you. So, you know, what, what have we learned? What have we learned in conclusion? Cognition and affect and pretend play can be measured using a standardized approach. Uh, we think both versions of the scale have good psychometric properties and easy to give. It's five minutes. Uh, and both imagination and affect expression and pretend play are associated with other measures of creativity independent of IQ. Positive and negative affect is associated with creativity. I haven't talked much about that. But negative expression in play is also associated with creative thinking. In young children, it's associated with pro-social behavior in the classroom, which always surprises uh, daycare teachers, but the ability to express negative emotion in a good story is actually related to good pro-social behavior, in, at least in this study. 
um, uh, the association between play and creativity is stable, relatively stable over time. And we can increase imagination in affect and play with this play facilitation intervention uh, with elementary school kids, transfer effects in two studies. Um, currently, uh, we are starting to do this kind of play intervention with children with developmental disabilities. So I'm working with a developmental psychologist, Anastasia Dimitropoulos, uh, who's an expert in this area. It's a genetic disorder, developmental delays. These children are uh, kind of rigid and inflexible in their thinking and their behavior. And so trying to help them become more imaginative through play uh, is, is what we are trying to do. And because they're scattered all over the country, it's a rare disorder, we've been using a telehealth approach. And what we've learned so far is that we've been able to do these play sessions, like you saw me doing with that child. If they have the toys and we have the toys, and we've met the child first uh, doing baseline assessment. We meet the child, we tell them what the computer intervention is going to be like. Uh, it's been feasible. The children can do it, they like it, parents give high ratings. We don't know if, if it's effective yet or not. Um, we should be finishing this study over the summer. Uh, but in terms of feasibility, uh, I think there are important implications there about uh, playing with children remotely if that is something that is necessary to do. Um, and we're also working, again, with these younger children that, with prader willi syndrome who are three to five, three to six-year-olds using a parent coaching approach rather than working directly with the child. And that's supported by the Prater Willey Research Foundation. Um, future research recommendations. It's important to assess pretend play to identify creative potential in children. Um, a lot of children are being missed. Uh, they may not do so well on IQ tests, but they have a lot of creative ability. And if that could be identified and worked with in school settings, that is really an important thing to do, especially for uh, low-income uh, kids. We need more play training manuals, <laughs> manuals that uh, are relatively standardized. Uh, what are the play and event play prompts that seem to be working that can then be disseminated uh, to people who work with kids in, in many different settings and to parents. Uh, focus on low SES kids or below average players. Large samples, it's so hard to get large samples in this area. Um, and uh, what we think for preschoolers is it, it's important to have parental involvement in the home so that there's continuity. Um, and play in the classroom, a lot of implications for play in the classroom. Play could be used in the classroom um, thank you to my graduate students. And uh, I have lots of references if people are, are interested in that. So, questions, <laughs> comments? So we've got a microphone, so just raise your hand if you have a question. <laughs> And, uh, and am I going to come around and bring you I, I probably don't need it. I okay. think you're a woman. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the fact that children, young children, and older children spend so much time on iPad and telephones and all that, how does that affect the child's creativity, present play, imagination, and so there's a lot written about this topic. Did you hear the question in the back? How, do, how does technology really affect uh, play and creativity in children. There's a lot written about the topic, not a lot of research on that topic, and there really needs to be. There are people who are starting to do it now. Um, between 2000 and, between 1987 and 2008, we had about 14 samples of play in children using this play measure. So we could see what happened to 
at least over that 20 years, what happened to children's play. We thought it would de playability would decrease. It did not decrease. It did not decrease during that period of time. Even though these children may not have played a lot at home, they still had the ability to make things up and use their imagination and express emotion. But it's been since 2008 that the iPhone has come along, the iPad, the, that things have really increased exponentially. We have play samples from those the, the last 10 years, and we really need to look at it and see. It's true that children are not playing as much, and I think the pediatric Academy of Pediatrics uh, reported on that. Um, and so they're not using their whole body. They're not using all of them when they're, when they're, and they're not making things up from scratch if they're just using technology. Um, but we don't know. Uh, Kim, Professor Kim, did a study using the Torrance test of creativity. During that same time period, 87 to 2008, and found that creativity decreased. She had large samples in this country. And, and according to that, looking at the Torrance test, creativity decreased, probably because of, of technology. So I think the jury is still out. You can have very creative video games. <laughs> um, uh, but if children, so. Yes. Can you hear me? Um, is the, <clears throat> did y'all find a correlation between um, children being introverted versus extroverted in y'all's um, play measure where y'all were videoing them and then scoring them afterwards? We haven't looked at it. We, in terms of the introversion, extroversion issue, we have not looked at it. Um, you know, that's the personality characteristics. I think a, a better way to think about it is, uh, you know, the, 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 the neo five dimensions. Uh, agreeableness, conscientiousness, openness to experience. And I think that dimension of openness to experience, whether the child is introverted or extroverted, are they open? Uh, are they curious? I think that's the more imp important personality characteristic, and that's the personality characteristic in adults that so consistently relates to creativity in adults. I guess my question was getting at whether they were willing to express what they were thinking in their mind and not reserve in their Okay, capacity. good question. Did shyness interfere? So, for older children, about 8% of 6 to 10-year-olds cannot, cannot do this task. They can't get into it. But after working long enough and consulting with other people, it's not shyness. We don't think it's shyness. It's, it's the inability to, do the, to pretend and to get a story going. So it's not shyness and reserve. It's, it's, it may come up occasionally. But um, also in younger children, the four- and five-year-olds with this different task, uh, it's not an issue. It's not an issue. They all do the task. They all get involved in those toys. What's different is that um, if kids can't pretend, if they can't pretend, they can still move those toys around <laughs> and do stuff, and, and they're not self-conscious about it. Um, whereas with older children, if they have trouble pretending with those puppets and blocks, they really can't do much, and it's, it's difficult. So no, we don't think shyness gets in the way. But it's a good question, and it's something we really wondered about uh, in the beginning. Also, it's important to have people who are comfortable working with kids. I mean, you have to have people who, you know, on the way from the classroom to the testing room or whatever, have helped the child feel comfortable, too. And if a child is really distressed or uncomfortable, we, we stop. We do something else. Well, unless someone raises their hand, I'll ask a question. Okay. Um, well, they have two questions. One was, I mean, I look at these children who are obviously, I'll yeah. say, brilliant at, at play, at pretend play, uh, but I know you're, you're looking at individual differences in this. Have you ever looked at relations between their scores on your play scale 
And um, you talked about pro-social yeah. uh, abilities in school, but what about their their friendships, their peer relationships, yeah. their peer school skills, relationship yeah. skills? We have not looked at it. We have not. Interested in looking at that? Yes. Yes. But what would you hypothesize or think that you might see? They should be, if they're more imaginative, they should be... Uh, better able to relate to other children because they can understand their point of view. It's the theory of mind idea. They can understand their point of view. We have found that children who are more imaginative in play score higher on an empathy measure okay. and also, um, yeah, and, and have higher emotional understanding. So that should translate to better peer well, I also involvement. Think it'd be more fun to play with. <laughs> so they and be more others. fun to, and be poor. Yes. One mistake we made in doing this study with a group of children, four, four children, we, we did pre and post measure on a lot of things. We didn't do a, we didn't do a peer social uh, relations measure. We should have done it. So next time, right, next time we'll do it. The question in the back. You, go ahead. I'll, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, would you say there's a correlation between um, children that have less resources and then having uh, greater um, creativity? Yes, because they have more challenges and, and need to make things happen on their own if they don't have toys. I mean, assuming they have an adequate environment. By adequate, I mean uh, adult attention and caretaking, you know. So, uh, if, if they have that, then meeting those challenges is practice with, you know, making their own toys, figuring out things, problem solving. So, yes, it can be an advantage. Is that kind of what you were thinking? Yes, yes. And, yeah. and the reason I was getting at that, because as far as technology, and going back to a question that you were asking, yeah. um, I was thinking that as far as technology goes, it helps develop the brain as far as the thinking process but it might uh, affect you in, uh, as far as the technical aspects of it uh, in relation of developing your movements and, you know, as, as from that aspect. I don't know if I explained that. <laughs> yes, but not in emotion so much, perhaps. But, but anyway, you were saying that it could develop some cognitive flexibility, and, and that, is that what you're yeah, saying? More like, more like motor skills, kind of affecting your motor skills as developing oh. creativity. Spatial, yeah, it does. Actually, there is research showing that, that it helps with spatial, spatial kinds of functioning, yeah. Hi there, thank you so much. Um, very interesting talk. I was wondering if you could explain the parent coaching aspect uh, that you do. So I've done a lot of work in schools with teachers, yeah. and oftentimes they just tell the children to go play um, and leave yeah. them to their own devices. So I'm wondering, um, First of all, what do you do with your parent coaching? What kind of tips do you give them? And two, do you think that can be translated to a classroom setting for teachers to kind of help facilitate these play schools in a classroom as well? So um, one of my students, uh, Claire Wallace, did a dissertation with children with ADHD and uh, parents who often have problems in their parent-child relationship. Right? And um, uh, what she did, and these were seven to six to eight-year-old boys and, and mother. And so she had three sessions. The first session, she, she mainly played with a child like, like this, um, with mother there, uh, and, and had already talked with the mother about basic principles of, of playing with a child. And the second session, uh, she did some, mother did some. And the third session, mother did all of the uh, play with with her, she with her in the room, um, co uh, coaching or or modeling, you know, in a sensitive way. Um, and we talked about this earlier um, uh, today. Um, uh, some parents are too directive. <laughs> some parents are disengaged. We also saw that in the museum uh, setting. And and I thought. You know, the, 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 it was mainly graduate students working with the child and the mother were quite successful in altering how the mother was interacting with the child. And then they practiced at home. They would, twice a week, had 20-minute sessions. 
Um, they did show improvement in the parent-child relationship, and they also did some free play observation, pre and post, and found improvement in how the parent related to the child. Uh, but it was mainly modeling and, and kind of giving tips. Incorporating it into the classroom, I think, can be done. Um, this is one thing we want to do at this Head Start Center. They're asking for it, but first we want to kind of see, learn ourselves in working with the children before, before doing that. Videotape, videotapes, I think, is one way to do it, and I don't know if people have tried that, but just having a videotape of a parent with a child interacting sensitively and facilitating their play, would, or a teacher, would be a good way to start, I think. Somebody had a second question. Oh, okay. Is this, why, why did you choose um, divergent thinking task as the link between creativity and the... Um, because uh, the divergent thinking test, even though it is imperfect, <laughs> is one of the best, more valid measures uh, of creativity. Um, divergent thinking test is how many uses can you think of for a button? How many uses can you think of for a newspaper? It's open-ended. You can think of many different things. Um, and, and it's one common uh, ingredient. It, it, most creativity researchers agree that this ability really helps people become more creative because they can come up with many different ideas. So it's a well-validated test, and that was the reason I chose that. Although that's not the only thing we use. We use story ratings and teacher ratings. We, we're trying to broaden out what we're looking at. But it's so well-validated, that's, that's why. But it is imperfect. Too. You can see the challenge in trying to predict creativity because to really predict creativity in adulthood, it depends on so many variables, uh, including you know, opportunity and, and motivation and personality variables in addition to the kinds of things we've been talking about. Did you have a thought about that? Yeah. Um. Well, I, I see the link between coming up with more stories to use yeah. with the, the toys and the divergent thinking test. Yeah. Um, but I kind of see that as narrow view of creativity as yeah. a whole. So it's kind of like a convenient yeah. Um, yeah. comparison. Yeah. And you're right. You're right. But it's, it's, which is why we're also trying to broaden out. And, and and that these kids can also think of more things to do in difficult situations, or uh, their teachers see them as, as more creative. But yes, we need better, we need more measures. Okay, we got one, one more question. Well, um, I, that's, here's T Sandy, pardon me. Okay. <laughs> Have you looked at all at um, pretend play among peers? No. And other than, other than this group of four children, and we had groups of four, uh, and in the group of four, it was similar to you know, making up stories, but we had them take turns. <laughs> you had to work on turn taking, et cetera. But no, we haven't, and the reason we haven't is because it's, that's where I think personality factors come into play. So if you have a shy child and a dominant child, um, you know, are you really get at the, getting at the shy child's creative ability? It's a much more difficult, I think, um, kind of thing to do. So that's why I haven't done it. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm, I'm following up on the question about whether to leave children on their own devices. Whether, um, what? whether to leave the children to their own devices when oh. they play. Yeah. So I often feel conflicted when I watch my two boys when they play, and they play well, they express whatever they want to express, they talk, they create stories, and I, you know, I like, okay, 
I, I shouldn't even intervene. They, they, they doing so well. So, but you would say that actually parental involvement is I a think good from, ingredient. I, from three to four, two, three, four year olds, maybe five year olds. Yes, parental involvement is important to play with them and enjoy it and have fun. But for older children, six on, most kids really don't want you involved. <laughs> so don't. <laughs> They're, they're fine on their own. And when we're talking about play intervention, it's for kids who, you know, really need help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even then, probably not the parent who should be doing it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, before, before we go, uh, just a few announcements. Uh, I believe they're selling copies of Dr. Russ's book outside, and I'm sure she'd be willing to sign yeah. a copy if, if, you, uh, if you would like her to. Um, uh, if you go, if you have uh, the program here, you go to the website listed in the program, values.utdallas.edu. You can sign up for our mailing list to come to more Center for Values events. Our next event is April 18th. Vlad Glavino is going to weave culture into the discussion of uh, the psychology of imagination and creativity. It should be a really interesting event. You can also find out about our annual conference upcoming in May there. Um, Margaret, do you have anything, you have another speaker you want to announce? Yes, uh, Andrea warner Sis will be at the next Center for Children and Families lecture and it is the 20th of April? It's, it's right before, it's the Friday before your Wednesday. Okay. So I guess Great. April 13th. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and that will be uh, on Friday morning, 9.30. Great. Please join me in thanking one more time Dr. Russ. Thank you. Bye.